Uh, good morning. Uh, welcome to the 14th meeting of 2017 of the Environment, Climate Change, Land Reform Committee. We have apologies from David Stewart and Morris Golden, and we've been joined by the substitute member of the committee, Peter Chapman, MSP. Uh, before we move to the first item on the agenda, I'd like to remind everyone present to switch off mobile phones and electronic devices as they may affect the broadcasting system. Uh, agenda item one uh, concerns uh, the committee considering whether to take items six and seven in private. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. Agenda item two is subordinate legislation. Uh, legislation. The second item on the agenda is for the committee to take evidence on the Forestry Environmental Impact Assessment Scotland Regulations 2017, SSI 2017-113. A motion to annul has been lodged by Mark Roscoe, MSP. As is the usual practice in such circumstances, we will have an evidence session first with the Cabinet Secretary for the Rural Economy and Connectivity uh, uh, to ask questions or seek clarifications. Uh, I welcome the Cabinet Secretary this morning, um, along with his officials Bill Brash, Claire Dodd, Barry McCaffrey and Brendan Callaghan. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, do you wish to make any opening remarks? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, thank you very much, Convener, and good morning, everybody. Um, I very much welcome the opportunity to present and explain this SSI to you and committee members. Its amendments form part of European law and they must be incorporated into the domestic legislation of Member States by the 16th of May. Uh, failure to transpose would expose Scotland and the UK to a risk of infraction. In transposing the directive into law in Scotland, I have sought to achieve an appropriate balance between ensuring that our approach uh, to creating woodland protects the environment and biodiversity and creating an enabling approach to planting for businesses and communities. As we're all aware, creating woodland and planting trees is a win-win situation for Scotland, particularly to help achieve our ambitious climate change targets with trees soaking up approximately 10 million tonnes of CO2 each year. The change that I understand is causing concern relates to increasing the threshold for EIA for forestry projects out with sensitive areas. I, I want to reassure members by putting that change in its proper context, and it's not happening in isolation. The SSI introduces another change which would increase the definition of sensitive areas to include PT soils. There is no threshold for afforestation in sensitive areas, meaning all such schemes must be screened and in national scenic areas, the threshold remains at two hectares. The proposal to increase the threshold for environmental impact assessment from five to 20 hectares out with sensitive areas is a modest and proportionate action given the pressing need to increase woodland creation in Scotland. And whilst Wales and Northern Ireland are not proposing to change their threshold, members may wish to note that the corresponding legislation in England uh, proposes an increase to 50 hectares for low-risk areas. Since the year 2000, convener, only five schemes out of 800 below 20 hectares have required an environmental statement following EIA screening. That's a maximum area over those uh, 17 years of 100 hectares. This legislation will not result in a reversion to planting up the flow country. That cannot happen. The new regulation expands the definition of sensitive areas where EIA is always required to include PT soils and only applies to very small schemes. This suggests there is little risk to increasing the threshold to 20 hectares. Raising the threshold will also enable better deployment of staff resources, convener, which should be focused on encouraging more and larger schemes to come forward, whilst also mon monitoring those to better address the environmental impact of genuinely difficult and potentially damaging schemes. It means we'll be better placed to manage and minimise the potential impact of planting. The change in threshold will also provide an important signal about this government and indeed this parliament's commitment to increasing planting and to diversity of woodland creation schemes. We know that concerns about the EIA process 
can deter potential applicants with modest low-risk schemes. In particular, this affects farmers, the very group that all parties are encouraging to integrate more woodland into their enterprises. It may also affect crofters as well. I want to reassure that good protections against the risk of these small schemes causing environmental harm will remain. Legislation includes provisions for exceptional cases, allowing the FCS to still require an environmental statement or take enforcement action on a small project below 20 hectares. I think it's an important safeguard that there is still the ability to take such enforcement action. The vast majority of five hectare schemes are convener likely to cost more than £25,000. In reality, there are very, very few planting schemes that are undertaken without grant funding. The procedures surrounding the approval of grant require all the appropriate checks against the UK forestry standard to ensure that that environmental risk is mitigated. And Mr Callaghan here is an expert and can fully explain all these matters if members feel that that would be useful. New guidance will be developed on implementing the amended regulations. This guidance will be clearer and will ensure that proper scrutiny is given to genuinely high-risk schemes. Initial, initial discussions relating to this guidance are already underway with both SNH and SEPA who support this change and we would welcome input from wider stakeholders such as Scottish Environment Link. That work will complement the relevant work streams in the McKinnon Delivery Plan. I think, too, there is more we can do to raise awareness of that guidance and of our expectations on those bringing forward planting schemes so that developers and communities are clear about the responsibilities to safeguard and to protect the environment in which they propose to create woodland. In conclusion, uh, convener, uh, I hope this addresses concerns which have been raised and will help persuade committee members not to annul this SSI. Planting more of the right trees in the right places is something that I think we all support. We need to focus our effort where it is needed, and this change, this change allows us to do just that. Uh, I and my colleagues am happy to answer any questions you and your members may have. Thank you for that opportunity. Uh, thank you, Cabinet Secretary. I think Richard Lyle has a question. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Um, can I ask you a couple of questions? We all know that Scottish uh, forestry is worth a billion pounds to the economy each year and supports 25,000 jobs. Would you agree that modern forestry planting is also creating new habitats for wildlife, places for recreation and making a huge contribution to meeting Scotland's ambitious climate change targets? Well, yes, I do, and, uh, and I, I think this really is a win-win situation. I think uh, more forestry is, is good for the environment and it's good for the economy. And you've alluded, Mr Lyle, to the value, the estimated value to the economy is uh, £1,000 million pounds a year and 25,000 jobs. Uh, and uh, the, uh, I, I, therefore, I, I see that this regulation is intended to safeguard the environment, but also to enable and facilitate the further expansion of the economic opportunities for Scotland that comes from this truly green industry. And I'm, I'm grateful indeed for the support <coughs> of uh, many organisations, including CONFOR, who are represented here and uh, are present here this uh, meeting today, uh, and the UK FPA, David Sulman, uh, and uh, many other organisations, including those that are seen as environmental ones. I note that CONFOR is represented here today. Would you agree with them in a submission that they've sent in that are saying, however, the reality is that unnecessary complex procedures for approving planting applications means Scotland has failed to meet existing planting targets for a number of years? And would you agree with me that we need to move heaven and earth in order to reach our targets, in order to ensure that we meet them? Well, yes, I, I think I, I, do, I, I do agree with uh, CONFOR's uh, um, statements there. Um, and we want to focus the time of our resources in Forestry Commission Scotland uh, on the most important cases. I mean, at the moment, the statistics show that uh, only five out of 800 cases that have been screened actually went to an EIA. That means that over 99% of the work was not required. And this is duplicatory work 
This is work which is carried out in, broadly speaking, when the grant system applies in order that the requirements of the UK forest standards are met. In other words, you can't get a grant without safeguarding the environment. You can't get a grant without looking into the environmental matters. Mr Callaghan can go into all the details of this, but I'm entirely satisfied that what we're doing today safeguards the environment, and that, um, that is the fundamental point I want to make to Mr Ruskell and indeed to all other committee members. But by removing that duplicatory work, uh, 150 cases a year, I think, you know, that work, that time of individual case officers, skilled professionals, can be put to better use by looking at the really important cases where there may, convener, be a, a serious issue in relation to the environment. So, so I think this regulation is intended to remove duplication, allow staff time to be focused on, on the real cases that, where there is a genuine environmental interest. And lastly, in some cases, the current procedure causes delay of, in some cases, uh, two months or more. And I think delay has been identified as one of the barriers to, uh, to uh, more investment. And all of these matters flow from the Jim McKinnon report, which I was very grateful received a, a pretty wide support when we debated these general issues in Parliament fairly recently. Thank you. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary, um, there is a, a claim out there that the UK forestry standard is not a suitable alternative to EIA as it's primarily aimed at woodland management as opposed to creation. How do you respond to that? Uh, well, I, I put this claim to my officials and basically I respond to it by saying that it is not correct and uh, I think uh, it might help if my officials could give the technical detail because, you know, I'm not an expert in these matters, but, but that essentially is the answer I was given. I don't know if it would help if Mr Callaghan could respond to the question in his way. Uh, certainly, uh, Cabinet Secretary. Um, yes, the UKFS covers all aspects of woodland management, including woodland creation. Um, you might expect the be focused to be on woodland management because Scotland has 1.4 million hectares of existing woodlands and is aiming to create 10,000 hectares a year. But there are a number of very specific guidelines and requirements which are worded and aimed specifically at woodland creation. I'm happy to give a few examples. Um, but it is a major focus because despite it being a small component of the overall area of woodlands, it is recognised that it, it is potentially a higher risk area because of the land use change. So, for example, um, one of the requirements under the biodiversity area would be the implications of woodland creation and management for biodiversity in the wider environment should be considered, including the roles of forest habitats and open habitats in ecological connectivity. That's an example. I could, I could you know, give you some more if you wanted. I think that's, that's fine. Uh, Mark Roskell. Yeah, thanks, convener, and um, good morning, Cabinet Secretary, and thank you for joining us. Appreciate the, the time you're spending on this. Um, I've got a couple of questions. Um, I'm just looking here at the Forestry Commission Scotland website um, under the Environmental Impact Assessment pages, and it states that these regulations have been recently amended um, and that they've come into force already today. So that's a little, a little puzzling. Have I, have I missed the boat here? Or? Well, well, no, I think that's really for legal reasons, and uh, that's why we've got Barry McCaffrey here, who perhaps can explain the, the kind of legal framework for these particular SIs, which, of course, with a particular deadline to transpose and implement in national law the general requirements for EIA across all the board. So perhaps Mr McCaffrey could explain that, uh, convener, because it's a perfectly sensible, fair question. That date flows from the amended directive itself, which required all member states to implement the changes to the EIA regime in time for 16th of May. Uh, so together with other administrations throughout the UK, that, that's what we've done. So, so technically they, they are in force as of today. But, but this SSI is coming to this committee and this parliament today. If I put in an application for a block of forestry at 9.30 this morning, uh, it, it wouldn't be in force. So, isn't this doing a bit of a disservice to this Parliament that you're bringing forward regulations which haven't been approved yet? They're, no, they're, they're subject to negative procedures, they're, therefore they have taken effect and we've laid them and respected the 28-day laying requirements as is normal for SSIs. They're, they're not subject to affirmative procedure for approval. Okay, I've got another couple of other questions. Um, I mean, you state that you believe that 
the provision of environmental impact assessment <coughs> regulations is actually slowing down the planting rate in Scotland. And yet you just identified that there's been only, I think, was it um, six or was it eight um, EIAs that have been completed out of 800 applications? Five, okay, five. So how is, if it's five, how is that actually slowing down the planting rate? And well, uh, what, what, what's the analysis on that in sure. terms of the economic cost? Because my understanding of the process is that First, there's a screening process, which is light touch, which is about identifying environmental impact. Only then do we move on to a full environmental impact assessment. So which is it? Is it the screening process or the full EIA, which is slowing down planting? Um, well, my, I, I discussed all this with officials, and Mr. Callaghan could perhaps give a sort of practitioner's guide, but, but essentially, at, at the moment, uh, 795 cases out of 800 had a process which wasn't actually necessary because no EIA was needed so that process, which led to that conclusion, was one which occurred in 795 cases. Only in five uh, was the EIA necessary. That screening process there, it seems to me, convener, uh, involved an element of duplication. I was careful to say in the remarks I made a moment ago that in some cases that could be causative of delay. Not all cases, but in some cases, two months or more delay could ensue. Uh, for a process which essentially is duplicating a process which is carried out when, when the grant application is, is determined, because you cannot get a grant without complying with these, the UK forest standards. I'm told, although I'm not an expert, that these are the most rigorous in the world, and they are designed to protect the environment. Were that not the case, I would not be here and we will not be debating this law today. I'm satisfied that these uh, standards protect the environment and you cannot get a grant without complying with them to prove that your scheme does not damage the environment. So this screening work, it seems to me, logically, as Jim McKinnon identified in his useful report, that uh, is an element of duplication which, if removed, will allow us to not only streamline the system, in some cases remove delay, but also allow the staff attention in those 795 cases. And these cases each take, I gather, about one, or, one day or so on average. All those working days can be put to better use, I think, and to achieve the, the targets that we all share. I don't know if I, I hope I've encapsulated that, but perhaps Mr. Callaghan could, could add anything. Yeah, of, of course. Um, worth clarifying, the 800 cases are the cases in the category between five and 20 hectares. So that's the population that would be affected by this change since, the regulate, since we have our records go back to 2002 on this. Um, in addition to that, the cases above that, there are another 2,000 cases in, in total. And we, the figure is approximately 60 of those cases required um, environmental statements. So it's, uh, it's a different population. We, that's not the total number of environmental statements in forestry. The total number is the, the, the projects that required statements was around about seven, 60 in total. Right, OK. Just a final question, convener, and it's in relation to uh, pre-notification. Um, my understanding is that in Wales, they haven't adopted this approach. In England, as the current secretary has already outlined, there's a higher threshold of 50 hectares. But they have put in place in England a pre-notification, which would at least allow environmental issues to be flagged up early on, not at the end, not at the end when you know UKFS needs to kick in before you can uh, you know have a, a felling license granted, but at the beginning of this process, that pre-prior notification is part of the regulation in England. So what what was the thinking around not building that into the, the regulations in Scotland? I think the Cabinet Secretary has asked me to answer this one, if that's OK. Um, we, we certainly see that as an additional process. And um, given we, we have just undertaken the McKinnon review and we're looking at the most efficient and effective way of, um, of managing the woodland creation process, we, were, we did consider that, but we thought that was an additional step and wouldn't offer the same efficiencies. Um, as part of the McKinnon review process, we're looking at the end-to-end -end and 
one of his recommendations is that there should be much more upfront, right at the beginning, engagement with stakeholders and engagement between the developer and the Forestry Commission. And we want to capture that in revised, a revised process, revised Thank guidance. You. And we think that is the way to deal with the pre-screening. We, we are very keen on it. We are nervous that by incorporating that into legislation, it, do, it does create a burden and it's more difficult to be proportionate in that process. I, mean, I, th I think in discussing this matter earlier, it's a perfectly sensible uh, area to explore. I mean, my understanding as a matter of practice, and Mr Callaghan, correct me if I don't get this right, that when an application comes in, then the competent officers in the Forestry Commission won't just stay in the office, they'll go and look at the proposed site, a proposed area of plantations. Uh, uh, and very often, the convener, they will know it from their local knowledge, but they will go and inspect the locus, the proposed plantation, and then they will assist the applicant in order to identify any environmental issues which they feel are required. So that proactive, helpful, collaborative approach is one that I as I understand it is already, and quite rightly so, part and parcel of our forestry process and of the good work that our forestry officers do. Uh, and I think as a matter of practice that, that must be a, a good thing. But the guidance that we are, I mentioned in my opening statement uh, will, of course, further deal with this. And, as I said, I undertake to work with Scottish Environment Link and other parties to make sure that this guidance uh, secures the widest possible support, because that's what I wish to do in forestry matters, as I think members are aware. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary and officials. Um, I'm frankly really surprised that this has been put up on the um, Forestry Commission Scotland website uh, before the committee was in a position to um, uh, make its deliberations today. It may be a negative instrument, but it is coming to committee today, and it will then, um, you know, if we had concerns, which some of us have, to the point of one member wanting to annul, um, we're now in a position where it's already on the website, and I'd like to ask, um, firstly, why um, this has taken, it has only come to us on the day when, um, the, um, when we have to meet the EU deadline. And secondly, um, how, far, um, how far in the near, in the future is the infraction proceedings uh, and, and the risk of fines? Because I understand there's a, there are phasings to that. And I, and I do feel that this shows a disrespect for the committee and the Parliament, uh, building on what Mark Ruskell said, and, I, and I'm quite concerned about it. So I wonder if um, you, Cabinet Secretary, or any officials could comment on this. Well, you know, I'm grateful to have the opportunity to, to try to allay members' concerns, because, you know, plainly we mean absolutely no disrespect to this committee, and that, that's not something that I would tolerate. Um, my understanding is because it is a negative instrument, it will be enforced unless, it's, unless it is annulled today. If it is annulled today as a result of the democratic procedures of this Parliament, then it will be annulled. It will be of no effect. Uh, and, the, and I will ensure that the, the, the website of this Forestry Commission is immediately, today, altered to that effect. The reason why, as I understand it, and I did discuss this briefly with members beforehand, it's on the website, is because at the moment it is, is the, the law in force simply because of the requirement today to comply with EU law. Uh, that requirement in, is in practical, is in um, legal terms, convener, discharged, if you see what I mean. You know, we, we have passed a law, we have met the deadline, and the Forestry Commission, because it is currently the law and less annulled, are quite right to display a notice on the website of what the law is. It may only last uh, half a day, <laughs> or, or until the end of the session, if members are so minded to annul, but the process is the correct legal one and it is absolutely in no way uh, a matter of discretion. It is a process that is correct legally to demonstrate that the Forestry Commission have immediately complied with and met the, the particular law about, e, about transposition of EU law into the domestic legal system. So it's purely a technicality. I'm grateful that uh, Claudia Beamish has raised this because it's a somewhat sort of arcane legal answer I've given, but that is because it is an arcane legal matter, uh, and uh, it is absolutely the correct uh, uh, position. 
Um, we, I am advised that there was, in fact, no committee on the 9th of May, so this matter was put back to today, and today being the last day. And I, I, you know, I obviously have no criticism of, of, of the committee in this regard, uh, and the motion to annul, I think, was, was tabled on Friday. Uh, I don't know. I think Mr Brash is actually the expert in here, so maybe I'm uh, chuntering on when he could provide a more succinct explanation, Mr Brash. OK. Um, thank you, Cabinet Secretary. No, basically, we, we worked with our lawyers, and we, we have 28 days that we can lay the legislation, although Parliament, for negative legislation, although Parliament requires 40 days. We did do that. It had gone through, along with the other legislation we'll come to later, had gone through the Delegated Powers Law Reform Committee and was therefore ready to come to the lead committee to um, further back. But um, when I was liaising with the clerks, um, I was told that, unfortunately, it can't be seen on the, the 9th when it was perfectly ready to do that. It had gone through DPLRC in early, I think in early uh, April, so it was available to for the committee. But because of that meeting, they decided to bundle all these um, pieces of legislation together, some of which went through DPLRC quite a while ago, the electricity one, f f for instance. So I'm afraid we were in the hands of the, the committee when they could fit us into their schedule. But we were. It was available to, to be seen. That's correct. The committee didn't sit last week, and that has been a factor in it. But you can understand the concerns that are being expressed yes. by members today around us. It's been good to get this issue aired on the record. Yeah. Uh, can, um, with respect, that doesn't answer my question about if it hadn't been put up till after the committee had heard it today, out of respect for the committee, how soon would it have been in terms of um, UK infraction process that we would have jeopardised our, our situation as Scottish gov as Scot or your, your situation as Scottish Government, which I, of course, have to, would have to take into account? Um, because I understand there are several phases before we'd get to that. So would it not have been more appropriate, or perhaps it might be something that could be more appropriate in the future, to, it's there now, but unless, unless um, it, there's a motion to annul, to just put it up later in the day, as long as there wasn't a motion to annul. It just still, in my view, I want to push this point, seems a little bit um, ahead, of, ahead of things. Well, it is the law now in accordance with the negative procedure. Um, we need to, as a government, we must comply with the law and we must do so immediately. There's, there's just no question about that. Regarding the infraction process, it is a process, it's not an event. And Claudia Beamish is quite right that there are stages of infraction. And uh, I mean, if, if, if this is important, I'm sure Mr Brash can explain what those stages are. But I mean, plainly, from my point of view as a government minister, I want to avoid any infraction, if I possibly can, and to take all prudent steps so to do. Uh, uh, and uh, I think that the Forestry Commission were right to do what they did, which is to comply with the law. Uh, if it's altered, they will immediately comply with the law and make uh, appropriate amendments to the website today, in the course of today, if that were to be the decision of this committee and this parliament. Right, well, thank you, convener. I've got one other question, unless anyone wants to take up this point further. Thank you. Um, it, it was just for um, clarity, Cabinet Secretary, about the, um, the UK uh, uh, FS scheme, um, which it's been highlighted to me, and this may or may not be correct, but I would, I would seek clarity on this, that... Um, it doesn't have a statutory status that is in the main voluntary and that um, uh, its um, status is open to question on private land. And I think it would be helpful just to have some clarity on, on those issues, because it may well be misinformation, but just for the record, that would be helpful. Well, I, I think if I could pass to Mr Callaghan, he can probably give you the authoritative answer, if that's uh, permitted, convener. Yes, certainly. Um, yeah, the UK FS brings together a whole suite of um, guidelines and statutory requirements that, that exist in law re relevant to forestry. So many aspe aspects of it are actually statutory. Um, they, they may not be specific forestry legislation. It could be to do with water or, or um, protected habitats, um, designated sites, things of that nature. So it, it, in terms of the forest manager, in one place he has all of the statutory requirements and the good practice guidance that, that we would expect them to comply with. But the, the real bite is that we have, 
it, it is, in a sense, almost statutory because it is part of our Scotland, Scottish Rural Development Programme. So the condition of providing grant aid is you must comply with the UK forestry standard. And, and that is pseudo-legal in that it is, it is part of our approved programme with Europe and that is enacted in legislation in Scotland. So in a roundabout way, the guidance becomes almost as of, of a legal standing. Right, thank you, that's helpful. Okay, thank you. Does any members have any other questions on this topic? No? Okay, before we move to agenda item three and the consideration of the motion to null, Cabinet Secretary, I'm mindful that you have Claire Dodd with you offering expertise in this area. I want to just raise a question about one of the other SSIs, if I may, and that's the SSI on flood risk management. Um, there was a consultation in 2016 on these proposals, but it didn't include flooding activity. I just would like to be clear why, when there's an SSI on flood risk management, that was the case. Um, we, we originally had the opportunity to be part of the project with uh, the number of other regimes that were taking forward um, you know, that main consultation. At the time, it was felt that due to the kind of technical and specific nature of flood risk, um, and the fact that we had well-established um, close working relationships with local authorities, it was decided that we would, um, decision was taken that we would develop our own timeline. Um, a, a full consultation wasn't carried out on our regulations, but engagement was undertaken with SEPA and uh, local authority experienced flood risk management practitioners to explore the various issues. The, the changes provided for in the flooding regs are main, mainly procedural, um, and there are no material changes to the way the assessments are carried out or when assessments need to be carried out. Um, and the work on the other regimes did precede the work that we undertook on our regulations. And uh, it was found that during the work that um, the provisions in our flooding regulations are broadly equivalent to those proposed in the other regimes. And that main regime did consult local authorities, SEPA and other EIA practitioners. So it was felt there was no added value for us to undertake a full consultation on our regulations. And feedback from that consultation was used to inform and develop our regula the flooding regulations. Okay, thank you for that. It's useful to get that on the record. Um, if members are content, then we'll move to agenda item three, which is consideration of motion S5M, Dash 05579, asking the committee to annul the Forestry Environmental Impact Assessment Scotland Regulations 2017 SSI 2017-113. It should be noted that Scottish Government officials cannot take part in the formal debate. I remind members that according to Rule 12.2a, Paragraph 4 of the Parliament Standing Orders, that substitute members have the right to vote. The motion will be moved with an opportunity for a formal debate on the SSI, which can procedurally last up to 90 minutes. I, I invite Mark Ruskell to speak to and move the motion, if he so wishes, that the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee recommends that the Forestry Environmental Impact Assessment Scotland regulations be annulled. Mark Ruskell. Thank you very much, convener. Um, so I've listened to the previous uh, agenda item, and I do intend to move this motion to annul. Um, having said that, I think there's a lot that we can all agree on. Uh, around this table. Um, we, I think, all agree on the economic importance of forestry, the fact that it creates 25,000 jobs in some of our most impoverished rural areas in Scotland. Um, I think we can also all agree that the Scottish Government's forestry planting targets, 15,000 hectares every year, will make a welcome and very significant contribution to Scotland's climate change plan. Um, and I think we can also all agree that uh, any regulations that place an undue burden, and I emphasise that word undue burden, on the forestry sector, uh, we need to look at simplifying. Um, however, I don't believe that the current environmental impact assessment regulations do place an undue burden on the forestry sector. Um, EIA is there because we need to look before we leap. We need to plan properly, and we need to get that planning in place up front within the process. Um, now, I hear what the Cabinet Secretary says about um, screening, but screening is not a full environmental impact assessment. It doesn't need, you know, hundreds and hundreds of reports this big of dead tree uh, and consultancy time in order to pursue a forestry application. Uh, it's a relatively simple process, but it does 
it does uncover potential environmental impacts that then may need, in a very small number of cases, uh, to be given further consideration. And it does bring transparency. And I know through undertaking uh, a number of items of casework uh, in the Ockles, um, near where I stay, that this EIA process can be very beneficial. Um, in one particular example, uh, we had a number of blocks of forestry that were proposed uh, in an area. There were concerns about access, there were concerns about archaeology, there were concerns about biodiversity. And actually the process was uh, very constructive. It involved, throughout the environmental assessment process, stakeholders being involved with the, the management company, with a proposer of the forestry application. Uh, and as a result of that, um, it was an iterative process where positive changes were made. And I think now we have, a, in one particular area, a very good uh, forestry planting scheme that's been approved. It has areas of commercial forestry. It gets the right balance. But that only happened because there was a very good upfront planning process which the EIA uh, had required as a result of that. Um, I am concerned about this raise in the threshold because I can see what might happen in terms of cumulative impact. Uh, proposers of forestry planting may well go forward and say, well, okay, we'll package up blocks of forestry just under 20 hectares, uh, which would then enable uh, a much simpler process to be put through, but one which would potentially miss uh, concerns about archaeology, biodiversity, access, all the issues that can sometimes arise with forestry. Um, the UK forestry standard, uh, I think, again, we could all you know, welcome that and welcome its in, in, in embeddedness into the guidance that the Cabinet Secretary is working on. Um, but it's not about planning. It's not about identifying where. It's not about identifying why. Um, and it's not about identifying what the impact will be up front within the planning process uh, early on. It is ostensibly about good management. I accept the points that have been made that if you want to then go for a forestry felling license at the end of this, you have to meet UKFS standards. So I applaud it, but it's not an upfront planning tool, and we shouldn't pretend that it is. Um, I don't see why, uh, to meet the terms of the European directive, we need to jump to this 20 hectare threshold. In Wales, uh, this approach has been rejected. Um, in England, as I mentioned earlier on, there is an increase up to 50 hectares, which is worrying. But there is this full prior notification process that has been brought in. And I think if the Cabinet Secretary wishes to remove the screening process, we need clarity as to what is that upfront part of this process that will identify potential environmental impacts at the outset and enable stakeholders to get involved uh, and to help to design uh, these schemes in a, in a more environmentally uh, protective way. Um, we've had the comment from uh, in the earlier item from Mr. Callaghan that uh, prior notification was something that we're very keen on, um, but it could also be seen as a burden. Now, I'm not sure w which one it is here. Um, if we had some certainty that this guidance is going to require prior notification, so that the proposers of these forestry applications will have to go to the Forestry Commission and there will be an iterative process that will involve stakeholders. Uh, that would bring some comfort. I mean, that's, that's the bare minimum which they've got in England, um, which I think we could do a lot, a lot better uh, in this Parliament. So I'll leave my opening comments there. I could ask you to formally move. And I will formally move the motion in my name. Okay, thank, thank you, you. Mr. Mr. Roscoe. Can I open this up to other members? Uh, we wish you to come. Claudia Beamish. Uh, thank you, convener. Um, I would like to also speak in um, support in favour of the annulment of the negative instrument. Um, I have listened very carefully to what uh, uh, you've said, Cabinet Secretary, and have had some reassurance on the points uh, raised. But um, when it comes to um, the, the point at which grants are applied for, that's not the same as actually looking at the point of the creation of the um, of the new scheme and I think that uh, the level of scrutiny that is there at the moment in terms of the of the hectares is is in my view the correct one and I do note that um, this was rejected in in Wales as my colleague Mark Ruskell has highlighted and that um, 
that there were clear reasons of an environmental nature for, for that as well. I am, I would like to say for the record, extremely supportive of the um, climate change targets, of course, and I do, I do hear the point that you make, Cabinet Secretary, about the, um, the support for um, uh, planting targets and the judgment that will be made um, if this does um, go through and remain uh, as, as um, the Scottish Government hopes it will um, in relation to um, peatlands and the flow country, and I, and I do think that is important. But I'm not reassured to the degree that um, I feel comfortable with, um, the, um, with rejecting the EIS as it stands at present. And so I, I will um, support the motion to annul. Uh, okay, uh, Kate Forbes. Thanks uh, very much, and I appreciate the points that my colleagues have made, um, and also the uh, briefing that was received by RSPB. Although I, I do think it is notable that it, we didn't receive many briefings on this, and RSPB was um, the only one um, against these changes. I think for me, the big question is whether there are standards that are fit for purpose to ensure that we meet um, environmental um, expectations when we are uh, planting. And the fact that 795 um, applications or 795 cases uh, did not require EIA um, and did not require, met the standards, I think is quite noticeable. I do think the Cabinet Secretary makes an important point in terms of planting being incredibly expensive, full stop, and therefore, although Claudia Beamish makes the point that um, grant funding, applying for grant funding is not necessarily at the point of, of planning initially, we do know that in terms of common sense, it is highly, highly likely that uh, any planting is going to require grant funding and therefore is going to need um, to meet the UKFS standards. So from that point of view, I whilst accepting the points that my colleagues make about the need to meet high standards, um, high environmental standards, I do think that most, the vast majority of uh, planting is going to require grant funding and therefore would require to meet um, the highest environmental standards. Uh, Richard Lyle. Thank you, Kandina. From very over the number of the last number of years, I've sat in this committee and um, listened to comments made by members that we weren't planting enough. In fact, the government was getting uh, hammered on various occasions by other members of other parties that the, part, the, the government wasn't planting enough. And, and I have to say that now that we're trying to plant more, we're now getting castigated because we're trying to plant more. I, I find it strange. But again, you know, OK, and I take conniscency, RSPB, but I'm really impressed with the con for, them. and I'll state it again for the simple fact. Scottish forestry worth a billion pounds each year. If we don't keep planting, uh, you know, we're, we're going to run out of, of, you know, the forestry uh, is going to go in decline and this... Uh, excellent uh, business that supports 25,000 jobs would be at risk in a number of years. And again, I missed out a, a point that, that is in this paper. If this economic and environmental success story is to continue, Scotland needs to plant more trees. So why don't people get it? We need to plant more trees. And as far as I'm concerned, you know, we're trying to resolve it, and I think we should be supporting this uh, subject. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lyle. Mr. MacDonald. Thanks, uh, Convener. I would concur with uh, the comments from Kate Forbes and, indeed, uh, Richard Lyle. I think it's worth noting, um, Convener, that there's been no objection from SWT or WWF Scotland. And I think a, a salient point in this debate is the, the Woodland Trust Scotland uh, comments, where they've said that they're prepared to accept the increase in the threshold in non-sensitive areas, given the current forest planning process and the safeguards provided by UKFS and the application of regional forest strategies. Okay. 
um, Claudia Beamish, I think you want to come back. I'd just like to come back uh, briefly just uh, on a point of clarification. What, um, I don't believe in any of the remarks that I made that I said that I was not positive about the Scottish Government's planting regime. In fact, I've been extremely supportive of it and pushed forward on agri agroforestry and all sorts of issues. Um, and made, tried to make sure that the SRDP schemes were there as well. The point I'm making is my concern is serious enough about the environmental um, arrangements at the stage of planting um, to, to say that I, I think that if we are having forestry, which we must have, and we must meet our targets, which I'm fully supportive of, it has to be done in an environmentally appropriate way, and, and that's where I am. Thank you. Peter Chapman. Thanks, Convener. I, I would just say that I support the government's aim to modernise and, and make the framework simpler. I think it has held back the planting targets, and I am I'm very supportive of increasing the planting targets, and I think we need to, we need to uh, put procedures in place to at firstly hit the 10,000 hectares and, and, and then go on to, to hit the 15,000 hectares eventually, and I am supportive of that. Um, We've got to recognise that this is a modest change. It's, it's, it's lifting the, the hectares from five to 20, but it's in low risk areas to start with. Nobody's suggesting that in high risk areas that this will, this will be, uh, take place. Every, uh, in my opinion, every planting uh, scheme has to adhere to the UK forestry standard, which I think is, is, is a, a, a high standard in its own right. And I see no problem in raising the, the area to 20 hectares, and I support Kate Forbes and, and uh, Richard Lyle, etc., and, and their thoughts on this. OK, thank you. Does any other member? Uh, Alexander Bonnet. Uh, I'd just like to echo Peter Chapman's comments. I've got no further comment, uh, save to note my register of interest, particularly regarding forestry, as previously declared. Uh, Finley Carson. I, I just like put on record that I, I don't actually agree with Richard Lyle that we should be banging on without uh, just to reach targets. I think it's very important that we do uh, take uh, recognition of the, of the importance of uh, the environment. However, the reason I'm supporting the government is that I am satisfied that the changes won't have a negative impact on the environment. And I think that's the, the most important thing. Okay, thank you. Uh, for the record, that I probably, like a number of members, had some questions coming into this session. Uh, for me, they've been answered. I think these are modest and proportionate changes. And like other members, I note the absence of any concerns being raised by a considerable number of, of um, respected environmental organisations. And maybe more than anything, I'm heartened by the Cabinet Secretary's comment about consulting with Environment Link and the development of the guidance. So I, too, would be inclined to support this. Uh, however, can I invite the Cabinet Secretary to respond? Well, uh, thank you, Convener, and thanks to all members who have participated in the debate, which has uh, uh, been uh, uh, an interesting and useful debate, I think. Um, and uh, I'd just like to make a, a number of, of points. Uh, firstly, I, I really would like to, to emphasise the two members who have indicated they, they still have concerns that um, you know, we, we are keen to address these concerns in substance as matters go forward with the guidance. And I've at the outset to uh, emphasise that we will engage with uh, Environment Link. And we, we have, and I have met with NGOs, uh, as has Joe, Joe O'Hara, the head of the Forestry Commission and colleagues, and we will continue that because, you know, we want to maintain as, as much of a consensus as possible. Um, I think it's fair to point out that under the new directive and this legislation, the screening process itself is more strict uh, than it was before. It's a point which perhaps hasn't been made uh, a, a, and that is correct for larger high-risk areas, I think. Um, we did, of course, look at 50 hectares as, as the case down south, but came to the conclusion that a more moderate measure uh, of uh, 20 hectares was appropriate, so that was a value judgment. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, perhaps we're between the Welsh and the English approaches, but I think it is a moderate pro proposal, as I think Mr Chapman uh, said, and... Uh, and uh, uh, and uh, that's a good thing. And also, I do want to st stress that the, um, there is no threshold at all for uh, land with peat of 50 centimetres or more or sensitive areas. They will have the screening for EIA, and many members have referred to that. So that's important. Um, the, uh, 
Uh, I'm grateful for the support of, of uh, the Woodlands Trust, uh, who do great work, which I saw in Loch Arkig, which I visited uh, a, a few weeks ago. Uh, and I'm, uh, I'm uh, uh, grateful for that support. Uh, and we are, are aware of the fact, of course, that the WWF have produced a report uh, a year ago or thereabouts that uh, unless we increase our plantings targets on these islands, then 80% of the timber that is used in Britain will have to be imported in just a few decades' time. I mean, that's a, a staggering uh, figure and one that we have to tackle. And I think Mr Lyle is correct to say that, that um, you know, we do need to, to increase our planting targets for the environment, but also for the economy. And for the economy, um, sawmillers are already stating that they are concerned about the drop in the availability of wood in just over a decade's time or so. Uh, and that's a matter of some commercial significance for some of them. And given that they are the mainstay of many rural economies, we, we have to, to pay heed to that. And I'm gratified that all members take that on board. Um, there's a lot more that I can say, convener, but what I want just in conclusion to stress is that uh, in taking forward this work, um, we will emphasize the importance of early engagement that engagement with stakeholders will continue. It's not affected by the removal of the requirement for screening. So, uh, so communities are the subject of, of close engagement, and that's encouraged, uh, as is engagement with the developer. And that will be very much at the heart of the new guidance procedure. And I'm more than happy to uh, keep members of this committee informed as to the progress and, indeed, uh, share uh, our proposals uh, if members of this committee would like in relation to the guidance uh, in order further to reassure those members who today I have perhaps failed totally to, to reassure. So uh, I would invite members to uh, support the government's uh, SSI today and reject the motion to annul. But thank you for the opportunity to speak on these matters. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Mark Roscoe, um, to wind up and indicate whether you wish to press or withdraw the motion. Yeah, um, thanks, convener. Can I thank... Um all members and the Cabinet Secretary for their, their contributions to this um, quite measured, thoughtful discussion. Um, I mean, I think at the end of the day, uh, to answer directly Richard Lyle's point, this is about getting the right trees in the right places. We all want more of them, but they've got to be in the right places. And, you know, we, we, need, we need some kind of environmental guidance around this. Um, I think the reassurance the Cabinet Secretary has given about the creation of this new guidance um, and the ongoing work with environmental NGOs and other stakeholders um, to get that right, to ensure that there is a proper planning process in place here um, that can step in perhaps where screening um, is, 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 is leaving, um, gives me some reassurance. But I'm still concerned that there isn't a direct commitment within this SSI to prior notification. Um, that's the backstop that exists. Uh, in the English legislation, which is arguably weak, but has been strengthened by the addition of that prior notification. And I haven't actually heard the Cabinet Secretary say that this guidance will incorporate that. There needs to be a backstop here. There needs to be a role for an agency to step in early doors and say there are environmental issues with this planting application and we therefore need to step in. We don't have that. And I think for those reasons, um, I'm not reassured enough uh, to withdraw the motion at this stage. I'd like to push it to the vote. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Roscoe. So the question is that motion S5M05579 in the name of Mark Roscoe be approved. Are we all agreed? No. no. So we uh, go to a division. Uh, members who are in favour of the motion, please raise their hands. Two. Two. Are those who are against... Abstentions? No abstentions. <clears throat> so the result is there were two votes in favour, eight votes against. Um, so the committee's report will confirm the outcome of the debate. Do we have the agreement from the committee for the convener to approve the final report? Right. We do, thank you. Uh, the motion is so the motion is disagreed to. Uh, I thank the Cabinet Secretary and officials for attendance this morning. Um, and we now move on to Agenda Item 4. I'll give a couple of moments for the officials to leave.
We move to agenda item four, which is for the committee to consider four negative instruments. These are listed on the agenda. They are namely the Electricity Works Environmental Impact Assessment Scotland Regulations 2017 SSI 2017-101, Flood Risk Management, Flood Protection Schemes, Potentially Vulnerable Areas and Local Plan Districts, Scotland Amendment Regulations 2017 SSI 2017-112, Agriculture, Land Drainage and Irrigation Projects, Environmental Impact Assessment, Scotland Regulations 2017, SSI 2017-114, and Marine Works, Environmental Impact Assessment, Scotland Regulations 2017, SSI 2017-115. I invite any comments. Richard Lyle. Yeah, what concerns me, Convener, is in each of these, you know, and, and I'll draw, regulations contain minor drafting errors. Uh, regulation 13.5b refers to Regulation 11.1, but was intended to re refer to 11.2, and then you go on to other ones. It could be more clearer, could be um, draw the instrument, we've, not, uh, uh, we've referred it the wrong way around. You know, can we say to someone somewhere, can you get these right the first time, please? Thank you. That's a view that the DPLR committee has expressed on previous occasions. Uh, any other comments on these? Okay. Do we wish to take up Mr Lyle's point as a committee in writing to the government or this, or, or do we entrust that task to the DPLR committee? There was, you know, I, again, I remember the last time I was on this committee, there was serious concern that several um, points were being missed or uh, mm -hmm. not correctly laid uh, instruments. And basically, I know the committee at that time did write to the government. Um, there was uh, concerns. The, um, it does strike me, however, personally, that these, these errors are minor drafting errors. They're about clarity. They're not major. That's my view I would express. Right. We, we can write to the DPLR. Uh, raising this issue or to the government? I'm, I'm not going to press if it's not if it's not fair. Okay. Correct. So are members minded that we write to the government or no? No. Okay. I'm afraid you're I, I just wanted to highlight it can be I, and you've done that on the record. Right. So can I ask the committee whether it's agreed that it does not wish to make any recommendations in relation to these instruments? Right, we are agreed. Thank you. Uh, agenda item five uh, for today is consideration of a draft annual report for the parliamentary year from May 12, 2016 to May 11, 2017. Hasn't time flown? Um, I refer members to the draft report and invite any comments. Claudia Beamish. Uh, thank you, convener. Um, I think the report reflects um, very very well in my view, the, the wide range and depth of the scrutiny that we've attempted in this committee. I would like to see um, under point three um, about the draft climate change plan um, uh, a, a little more detail because this was one of the major um, areas that we scrutinised and, and took evidence on um, in, in this year. And I wonder whether we might highlight the issue of how the committee was agreed in our report to um, look, look further and scrutinise the final plan further, and then also to take forward the monitoring of the plan once finalised as it develops. So I would be keen just to highlight those two points, or possibly others, uh, if other committee members felt that was appropriate. But I feel a little bit more detail on that area would be valuable. It does seem like a reasonable point. Any other views on that? the debates we've had in the annual report, in the chamber debates. The debates in the chamber? Aye, like climate change, dear management. That seems like a reasonable suggestion as well, if we add those in too, because we have had a couple of debates. Um, in terms of agreeing the wording that Claudia Bemis has suggested, um, can I suggest that we clerks draft a formal wording and we send it around members for agreement? Um, rather than wait till next week. Is that okay? So if you would respond to that by uh, tomorrow evening, um, that would be helpful. We can get the report completed. Is that agreed? Okay. Um, so the annual report will be published next week. Uh, the future meetings, 
Um, the next meeting on the 23rd of May, the committee will be considering its work programme and petition PE 1615 on state regulated licensing uh, for game board hunting in Scotland. As agreed earlier, we will now move into private session. I ask that the public gallery be cleared as the public part of the meeting is closed.